Uh, my name is Paolo. I'm an engineer at Red Hat, and uh, I changed the title of the presentation compared to what you have in the schedule because I like this one better. So who am I? Uh, I work uh, at Red Hat in the core platforms uh, team in virtualization more specifically. I'm also the upstream maintainer for KVM. I do have uh, some contribution to Fedora, but honestly, not much on CentOS, and I generally don't have much to do with CentOS, so why the hell am I here? Uh, so I would like to show you how I work uh, on the CentOS uh, stream kernel. Uh, lately, I've, I've been working also in the virtualization SIG, and uh, show how you can do the same. And uh, if that turns out to be hard uh, or impossible, we should work towards making it possible for you. Uh, I will talk a little bit about the kernel of uh, RHEL and CentOS stream. I will use the terms more or less interchangeably. Uh, and then I will go on why one would like to have an alternative kernel uh, to this one, but still based on what is in CentOS stream, uh, how you maintain it, and what Red Hat can do for you or should do for you. So uh, the, the RHEL kernel, the CentOS kernel, is affectionately the named also the Franken kernel by some people. And uh, as you all probably know, it's officially a 5.14 kernel. Uh, here I picked like five random subsystems, but this can be replicated for pretty much everything in the kernel. If you look at uh, RHEL 9.0, uh, what you get is something like this, where some uh, subsystems, for example, networking, were already actually more um, like a 5.16 upstream kernel. Uh, XFS was still 5.14, but for example, the block subsystem was updated to 5.16, so there were a couple patches that also affected the XFS subsystem. You can start understanding why the name. Uh, and, and it can only get worse. Uh, if you look at, <laughs> if, if you look at uh, the current center stream, uh, uh, it looks a bit like this. Like the scheduler pretty much is the same. There were some bug fixes, uh, but it's still pretty much a 5.14. Uh, uh, like, it's very similar to what you would have in the 5.14 uh, uh, upstream stable kernel. A KVM is uh, gone berserk, and uh, it has even some patches that are even in any up released upstream uh, Linux version. Uh, network uh, and, uh, is generally following uh, very closely, like KVM, uh, the recent releases. XFS has been updated, but not all the way up. Of course, it's a much more sensitive uh, package, so uh, subsystem, so, so it, it's basically 6.0-ish. Uh, EFI stood uh, completely stable until 9.3, and then uh, in 9.4, yours truly uh, brought it up to 6.5. So, it, it's a bit of a mishmash of things, but the idea is that uh, the parts that are more stable uh, uh, are there. Are, are, um, that are the, the parts that are more delicate remain more stable. The part where you have better testing or where you have uh, um, more uh, requests from Red Hat customers and partners, they they are uh, uh, much faster in, in tracking upstream. So, uh, actually. Already at the time of RHEL 9.0, there were about 8,000 commits on top of 5.14. At this point, we are at 80,000, which is basically, that basically means that 40% of what has happened uh, in uh, Linux 3 has made its way to, to CentOS Stream 9. And that compares, for example, to about 15,000 for a comparable uh, long-term uh, stable um, uh, version from, uh, from uh, upstream Linux. And uh, comparing the, the latest uh, kernel that reached end of life, which is 4.14, for, for, uh, that uh, had uh, over its whole lifetime about 25,000. I didn't run any numbers on, on RHEL 8 uh, and CentOS uh, Stream 8, but I would expect that by the time we get to uh, 9.10, we'll probably reach about maybe 150,000, something like that. So why is this possible? Uh, it's not that uh, us at Red Hat are magicians or 100x engineers. Uh, it's a combination of uh, good practices, both uh, upstream and downstream. Uh, upstream uh, 
If you look uh, at uh, a Linux kernel commit message, generally it will tell you very well what it, uh, uh, what it does. Uh, all, we, we don't do any squash, squash on merge, uh, needless to say. All, all the information are kept in the individual commit messages and uh, it's generally possible to go from uh, a commit in the Linux tree to a message on the Linux kernel mailing list. There are also well-defined maintainer boundaries, so the pull requests uh, generally uh, only affect uh, a, a small part of the kernel. Uh, and uh, when they don't, either because the area is large, like networking, or because uh, a pull request causes multiple uh, uh, maintainers, then we use a topic branch. The topic branch is shared across multiple maintainers. And uh, generally, it means that by looking at the um, uh, structure of the Linux uh, tree in GitK, for example, it will be complicated, but it will be precise uh, and uh, and it will match very well what happened during the development of those uh, patches. Downstream, uh, it's completely different. Uh, we have a lot more control on where the, the kernel is deployed, so we can do CI that is centralized. It's not like upstream kernel doesn't have CI. This is a common myth. There is uh, a lot of testing going on, but generally it's done at the subsystem level uh, because Linux doesn't own all the hardware that you, he would have to, to use to, to run CI, like it would not scale. Uh, in, um, in RHEL and CentOS, we, we managed to, to do CI, and there's also a lot of bots that uh, handle the more uh, menial parts of the review, which used to take a lot of time, but now it's, uh, it's left to, to, to programs. And uh, for this reason, we have completely different tools as well. As you know, Upstream uses mailing list. I'm not going to uh, talk about that topic, but it does. Uh, while uh, instead, all the development uh, downstream is done with GitLab. As an Upstream maintainer myself, I would never be able to develop uh, Linux using GitLab, but I would never be able to develop the, the CentOS stream kernel using Gmail. So, it's basically different tools for different uh, needs. Uh, if you want to contribute to the center stream kernels, the tools that you need to use, of course, are uh, Jira. And, uh, and also for GitLab, uh, it's not the dist git, uh, it's the source git. Uh, source git was, in fact, introduced like 15 years ago uh, for L5 and L4 in the, in, uh, in, in the kernel. And uh, these days it is in GitLab. and uh, uh, it, uh, it uses merge requests, uh, and you can see that uh, some of the merge requests uh, could be large updates, in this case, one that updates the driver to 6.4, and or, or they can be small bug fixes. And generally, there's uh, one to three new packages uh, produced every week. Now. Then maybe towards uh, the end of uh, the development period, it goes lower. But now there's several per week sometimes. The, there's no individual patches in RPM. This is not a throwback to 2012. It's just because it just it wouldn't scale. You wouldn't be able to apply 80,000 patches every time you rebuild the, the kernel. The merge requests must be tied to a Jira issue, and the Jira issue is recorded in each commit. I told before about the bots. Uh, uh, the basic uh, uh, thing that they check is that there is an acknowledgement in, uh, in Jira from the developers, uh, which means the, the subsystem maintainers uh, at Red Hat, and also from the testers who will do the testing uh, both before and after uh, the, the merge request is uh, included in, in the Red kernel. Uh, the, the bots also track uh, X uh, from, from subsystem maintainers for the thing that is uh, being uh, touched. Uh, it checks for any upstream fixes, so it checks for fixes uh, tags in all of uh, the um, uh, of the upstream Linux uh, uh, tree, so that uh, if something is missing, either you, you add it and you restart the CI, restart everything, or you have to explicitly say, I'm waving uh, this requirement, I'm omitting this fix for this reason. 
and then it also tracks the pre verification from, from QA and once the basic uh, verification uh, is done, the, the, um, uh, the kernel maintainer actually merges the, the merge request. Uh, so basically, how do you contribute? You create the Jira issue, you do one to 1,000 uh, git cherry pick dash x dash s. Dash x is very important. Uh, it uh, adds a line that is cherry picked from commit uh, a, b, c, d, e, f, and that is what allows uh, us to match all the downstream uh, uh, commits to the upstream. If you don't put it, the bots get angry at you. Uh, and it also checks that uh, the commits are identical. If they are not, it says, uh, reviewers, please check that this commit is different for a specific reason. Uh, in very rare cases, uh, there's rel only uh, or CentOS only commits. I think it still calls them rel only for uh, historical reasons, of course. That's why I'm using the terms about a bit interchangeably. And uh, also, one thing that you have to do mostly by hand is to add the metadata that links the commit to the issue. It's just a line with Jira and the number. Once everything is done, you create a merge request. Uh, it's pretty much impossible that uh, you get everything right the first time. So it's probably better if you put, first make it a draft merge request, and once the bots are happy, you remove draft. So uh, since we have this wonder of engineering, uh, why would you even consider having an alternative kernel uh, and not just use uh, the, the central string kernel? And the three main reasons that I could uh, think of are either you want a configuration that is not enabled or just different between, uh, between rel. I mean, rel itself builds the... Mm, the, the, the kernel in three different uh, varieties. There's the normal one, there's the real-time one, and there's the automotive one. So maybe you want something that is a little bit different. I don't know, some eBPF or whatever thing. Uh, maybe you have uh, some code that is not yet upstream and uh, that's uh, mm, something you want to test early. Uh, that's actually why I'm here, uh, in the sense that I got uh, into CentOS because uh, I wanted to do very early testing of some uh, KVM stuff that is not yet upstream and uh, basically share it with uh, other people that wanted to do the testing. And uh, we do all the testing in the virtualization SIG and uh, this way we know that it's fairly stable and uh, everybody is happy that... Uh, even if we are a bit late, maybe including things in RHEL. Uh, or maybe you have an extra feature that is not desired in RHEL and you want to, to actually uh, build it and uh, maybe even keep it up to date, just like the various subsystems that, uh, that are in, uh, in the RHEL kernel. So the challenges that you have in doing this kind of contribution to an alternative kernel are basically how to keep up with all the things that are going on, uh, uh, all, all the 80,000 uh, commits that, that are going on in center stream. Also, uh, it takes some um, uh, informed guessing of what to backport and what not to backport, uh, what commits uh, to include and what to skip. And sometimes also, especially in the case where you have uh, tweaks to the configuration, you might have some compilation failures. And so you have basically to, to fix it. And uh, if it's something very, very small, uh, it's enough to put it in, in an alternative kernel build. Otherwise, you might, may want to go through the, the co contribution process. Um, and uh, generally the things that you put uh, in, uh, in an alternative kernel fall into three groups, uh, mostly by size. Bug fixes hopefully will not be huge. I mean, maybe five is a bit optimistic, but it's unlikely that a bug fix will require more than, I don't know, 10 commits or something like that, no matter how much you, you split it. Maybe you want some backport and that can be a bit bigger. And then the really, complicated ones that are actually are the main part of kernel development uh, at Red Hat are the mass backports that are 100 or more commits like the ones that I showed uh, in, the, in, the initial, uh, in the initial little uh, drawing. Uh, why are they different? Because for bug fixes of feature backports, usually it's a matter of finding the, um, 
the, the patch on the Linux kernel mailing list and just applying it downstream. You have to, to match the, the commits with git cherry pick, but it's, it's not a huge deal. But when uh, you are dealing with uh, 100 or more commits uh, that were sent by many developers to a maintainer, basically you have to kind of reverse engineer what the maintainer did and uh, apply the same uh, patches that the maintainer included upstream uh, down onto your alternative kernel. How do you do uh, that? Uh, the, the basic thing uh, that you start with is just a git uh, log uh, command. Uh, here you have a bunch of, uh, of uh, commit IDs and, and commit names. Uh, here I decided to do it from 6.4 to 6.6 for no particular reason. Uh, and also, of course, you won't have just one um, director usually, but just for simplicity and shortness. The problem is that uh, usually when you look at something like Arch86 KVM, you have a lot of things that are clearly about KVM for Intel, but then every now and then you get some stragglers that, yes, they have something to do with, with virtual machines. They, they mention VM Clear, VM CS, whatever. But in, remember I, how I said that uh, upstream you tend to have uh, very well defined binder, boundaries between maintainers. Here you are effectively uh, going into someone else's uh, terrain by including that commit. So you have to basically reconstruct what happened. And for that, the, the main tool is, uh, is git describe. Uh, and you get this beauty. It means that the patch was included in, in 6.6 RC1. This one uh, is uh, the, the merge commit from Linux. And then uh, uh, this uh, caret two, because it's a merge commit, it has two parents. So the first parent is still within uh, Linux is three, while the second parent is what came from the maintainer. And then uh, in this case, there was uh, a, another sub com merge commit uh, within the maintainer tree. So uh, basically in the end, uh, you, you just uh, uh, remove the patch within the pull request and you keep the path to, to Linux. Uh, and uh, for, from that, you can basically use git k to show what was in that pull request. You can see that I removed uh, the, the 43 and I changed uh, this um, one, which was like the penultimate patch to two. And then I, I show basically one pull request. Sometimes uh, there can be missing commits. Uh, I didn't include the script uh, here, but one other thing that I do is uh, I run uh, git describe on the output from, um, from the previous uh, git log uh, command. And in this case, you can see, for example, that uh, between uh, the, some of the lines, for example, it, it was all very nice. It had nine commits that were all together. And then it skipped from eight to 12. And that's wrong. It means that something else was there. And you have to figure out why again. The easiest way is to use git k see what was missing, and you add by hand the, the commits that, uh, that were not picked by git log. Alternatively, you start from the upstream pull requests. In this case, uh, you have a, to do a bit of uh, spelunking of the Linux kernel mailing list. On the other hand, uh, all, the, um, all the commits are, are all grouped together, naturally. Uh, you can uh, search uh, also upstream uh, using git log dash dash merges. You search the maintainer name and uh, or you search for like pull KVM updates. Uh, again, the commit messages are good, so it works uh, fine. And then uh, you have to do the git uh, cherry picks the shells, the shells, the shells. I'm happy that I'm not the only one that included the shell scripts in the slides. This is very, very basic. It's basically, way it, go, it goes through the list, it picks the first one and it uh, does a git cherry pick. If it succeeds, it removes it with said and goes on with the second. If it fails, it exits and you have to solve the conflicts. So what do you do? Uh, you look at the pull request on LKML, uh, you use git log, uh, git k, git describe. Uh, it, it, it tends to be a bit recursive, uh, like <laughs> at some point, but uh, usually no more than two or three levels. Uh, once you're done, uh, you finally do a compile test. My suggestion is to not bother doing a compile test un until you have done all the cherry picks, because uh, it's actually a lot faster than it sounds and it, 
if you have to wait for make after every commit, you get really bored, you waste a lot of time, uh, and uh, you swap out uh, the, the concept. Yes? I don't know. I mean, uh, it's you partly are. So he basically said that it's basically Make's fault, uh, which I don't entirely disagree. But uh, I I ported uh, QMU to use Meson. I loved it. I r deleted 4,000 lines of code, but l it was really pushing the boundaries of Meson, and I I don't believe that Meson can build Linux with the current functionality that you have in Meson. Sorry, I mean, I, I, I am a contributor to Meson myself. I love Meson, but not for Linux. <laughs> also CMake, by the way, if there's any CMake fanboys. <laughs> so, so regarding the backports, how often it happens that you miss stuff? Like, for example, you have a bunch of code, uh, like a big feature, a bunch of commits, I mean, a big feature, and then in upstream, it actually happens that it's all isolated in a single directory. You get this listing, you backport everything, except yep. there is a stuff in lib. Never because I checked it. Like, it would happen very often, but I checked or I check for it and I, uh, I look for the missing commits. Like, here, these are all commits from the same pull request. So I go to look what was in 9, 10, and 11, and uh, I check. Like, it would happen a lot, but, but you check. It's part of the process. Yeah, but like, if you have pull requests which are somehow somehow related, like you have a pull request which introduces a feature yeah. in, in this directory, like whatever, in KVM, and then somebody, because you have a bunch of new code, it happens that there was a bug in some function which got called in that new, newly added code, but that function actually works in lib, and that's actually a separate pull request, so, sort of in introducing RC3 or whatever, and then you know, there is no so semantic uh, link from one yes. to the other. How often it happens that you miss stuff? Because Not it happens to us from time to time in systemd. It doesn't happen that often. Uh, it also depends on how good testing uh, you are. Uh, like in, in KVM specifically, we have a pretty comprehensive uh, test suite. And of course, I run it before submitting the pull request. It also helps that I'm the maintainer, so I know what was going on upstream. But I do maybe. 30% of the mass backports uh, of KVM, so it's it's doable. So for this kind of thing, uh, usually when I do it, I can do between 50 and 150 commits in an hour, like because most of them don't have conflicts and com and pass the compile test successfully. So it's not particularly fun work, but it's not bad either because I mean it's. The, the, it's like kind of an investigation. Like it's, it, you got to do what you have to do, but it's not like there, there are definitely worse things to do. Mm. Uh, one follow up. Yeah, sure, sure. Do, do backport stuff just in case. So you do backport pull requests which are sort of like preparation for something and then you are interested in then something later on. But then, if you didn't backport the preparation, then you would have conflicts. So, so it depends. For like uh, sometimes I do. Like for example, in uh, like last November, so between 9.3 and 9.4, uh, we were planning uh, one thing in an alternative kernel. So we uh, updated uh, all the MTRR patches uh, from Linux uh, 6.5 or something like that. And then uh, because of a patch that at the time was not upstream, and then this week I finally decided, okay, let's look at this patch that is not upstream and send it upstream since other the people that wrote it are not doing it. Then I look at the patch, the patch is wrong. It has to be solved in another subsystem. The MTRR backport was completely useless. Uh, <laughs> like it's not perfect, but uh, it, it, mm, it was stable code that I didn't have any problem uh, doing uh, ahead so there's there's always a tension between doing things like you were saying just in case uh, to save time in the future and doing things at the last moment to not do useless work it depends on how um, 
confident you are uh, with the codes. Like even within Linux, uh, not all subsystems are the same, not all patches are the same, sometimes things are worse than others. And that's where it's kind of the sensibility of understanding the state of the code. But yes, sometimes yes, sometimes no. Unfortunately, there's no single answer. So again, mm, okay. sure, sure. I mean, uh, yeah, just a real quick follow up. Similar idea, but uh, what about like fix ups to uh, existing patches? So, say you're in that example, you're pulling from 6.0, but maybe there is a fix for some of that. In yeah, the bots catch it. The, okay. the, bo okay. the bots catch it. Like, if, if like, Linux, uh, in general, Linux developers and Linux himself, the, uh, actually, not really Linux, more like Greg, because he's the one that handles the stable kernels, they like to have the fixes tags. So basically a lot of patches will have a fixes tags and the bot check for it and they will catch the missing fixes. Like you. you have to waive them specifically for the pet, for the merge request to be included. So again, let's go back to, to why you would uh, use uh, an alternative kernel. Generally you would have uh, uh, one or more uh, mass backports, uh, some fix up patches that maybe are not yet upstream or maybe they are not included yet because they are like corner cases until you, you implement your feature that make it, makes it not anymore a corner, corner case. Some patches may be destined ultimately to send a stream but some no. And, uh, this is actually what it looks like. Uh, this is uh, like the, the builds of the kernel with support for uh, TDX, so for confidential uh, virtual machines. And you can see that sometimes it goes up uh, and sometimes it goes down. It goes up when uh, I uh, either include more fix ups or when uh, I um, uh, do a, um, add a new feature, maybe the upstream uh, kernel that I'm including uh, in, in the SIG kernel adds 10 patches and they have a dependency of 50 more. So I go from 400 to 460. But actually, if you look between uh, those point, that point where, where it goes down pretty steeply, uh, this is when uh, the KVM backport was merged for L9.4, so I had about 150 patches uh, that were things uh, uh, that were not yet in, in CentOS uh, stream uh, for KVM. When I rebased, uh, 150 patches go away. But actually what happened is more like this. Uh, the, the KVM backport was much bigger. As soon as the backport was ready, I included all of it in the, in the SIG kernel and then uh, when it's merged, it rebases and it goes away. So uh, this is my first tip, in fact, to trap, uh, track uh, what is going on uh, in GitLab, track if there is any pending merge request for the subsystem that you care about. Uh, the bots, another thing that they do is they add labels for all the subsystems that are affected. So for example, if you are interested in, you know, in file systems, you, every week or something like that, maybe when you are doing some work, uh, you do a search for subsystem uh, FS. I think unfortunately there's no um, uh, kind of watch functionality in, in GitLab, but basically you can look at all the, um, the merge requests that affect a given subsystem. And uh, my suggestion is that you rebase your development tree on top of all the pending uh, merge requests. And now, uh, if you remember this use case, is, uh, uh, one of them is actually not very much like the others. The first two are relatively easy. Uh, the third one where you have extra features that Red Hat has disabled is a lot harder. Uh, why? Because if a configuration is not enabled in RHEL, maybe you may have a compile couple of, uh, of fixes for compile errors or something like that if you are uh, unlucky. But generally the, the delta will be very small. Uh, if you have a code that is not yet upstream, like it's a pain to maintain code that is not in, in upstream. So there's some kind of restraint towards unbounded growth uh, of the number of patches that you include. Instead, if you have extra features that are not desired in RHEL, let's say a file system, you get the worst of both worlds because uh, it uh, will have uh, patches in lib, uh, for example, dependencies in lib, like you were saying before. Uh, it goes with every release naturally. So you have to do something about it. So uh, my tip here is basically to track the same upstream version as related features. Again, we saw before that XFS is stuck at 6.0. If you are backporting another file system, st stay at 6.0. Uh, but, uh, 
because that's what the XFS people are doing essentially. But on the other hand, uh, KVM was a lot faster if let's say you want to build a CentOS stream kernel for RISC-V, which I'm not sure is a good idea, but it's just an example. Um, then uh, you, you track uh, um, the, the KVM um, uh, RISC-V component as fast uh, as the rest of the KVM uh, components. Uh, if you need to go ahead of what is in RHEL, uh, you have a penchant for pain. Uh, you, should, uh, <laughs> you should contact the maintainer, you can find it in a file. Uh, the most important thing is uh, to discuss the timing with respect to the RHEL releases. And uh, my suggestion is that you don't create the JIRA issue yourself because the maintainer will give you the, the B word, like <laughs> people were saying before. Uh, and um, instead, the best thing to do, in my opinion, uh, is to just open a fake marriage request in your own repository. Of course, it won't run all the bots and everything, but it, it, it gives a quick way to see the list of commits, to see the files that are touched, uh, and stuff like that. So it gives something uh, visible uh, to, to, the, to the maintainer. So uh, at this point, uh, all, all of this was done from a privileged perspective because even though I'm working in the virtualization SIG right now, I'm still a that employee, so I have contacts with the QE people, uh, with the other maintainers, I can uh, go and nag them if they don't review the merge request and so on. Uh, this is the last uh, question slide with basically the, the wish list. Uh, so what could Red Hat do for SIX that want to have um, alternative kernels? Uh, the, the main thing is that uh, acknowledging that, that alternative enterprise kernels are a legitimate use case, and it's something that we want to facilitate in CentOS stream. I, that, that's not a small thing, but it's the more important one. And in general, more communication between uh, the special interest groups in CentOS and uh, the maintainers that are employed at Red Hat. I was uh, happy to come here and uh, attend the meeting with the hyperscaler SIG, but I, it's the first time. Uh, and, uh, and I was the only one, so, uh, well, <laughs> like, uh, the more these things are distributed, the better. Uh, it goes without saying that I'm saying these are kind of an external observer into as not as a Red Hat employee. Mm. And uh, compilation failures are not that much of a deal. Uh, if there are reports of compilation failures, they can often be fixed uh, already while the merge request is open. So my uh, Suggestion is when you find, uh, like, a merge request stays open for a bunch of time, like a couple of weeks at least, more if it goes through a, a draft stage. So uh, if you rebase on top of the, of the open merge requests, it's much easier for you to jump in the issue, in the, not in the issue, in the merge request, and say, by the way, can you please also fix this compilation error that I have with my other uh, alternative kernel in, in the hyperscaler SIG or wherever? And uh, so basically, you, you all know it by now, there's a lot of process in creating JIRA issues and getting the testing done and everything. If these things are done before things are committed, there's no extra overhead. Once things are merged, uh, that's when where the pain starts. Uh, and. Uh, the other thing is to accept contribution that do not affect uh, rel configs. If all that goes in uh, is like a, a, a new hash define in, under the includes, there's no reason why betterfs code changes must not be in, uh, in the CentOS kernel. It, it will take some time to get there, but my opinion, and it's not just my opinion, I talked to other um, also team leads in the kernel uh, team at Red Hat. Our opinion is that we should get there. I'm not sure about how and when, but we should. And that's the last remark on the topic. <laughs> that, that's all I have to say on the topic. <laughs> okay, Neil. 
not for me then. <laughs> so this is all well and good. Uh, so um, the biggest problem I tend to have is this uh, is figuring out how to like be able to have a good back and forth type uh, synchronous conversation with them as I'm trying to work through things. Like a lot of times, like the, the asynchronous nature of the email stuff just leads to threads of blockedness where I can't really progress. Um, are you guys looking at maybe becoming a little bit more available on say like in a CentOS kernel matrix room or something like that, that people could like reach out and, and have informal light threaded discussions before we kind of move forward to like heavier work? Yeah. I, I see your point. Uh, like I, I am myself not, for example, in the Fedora or CentOS uh, or CentOS uh, matrix uh, servers. Some people you can find them on the upstream uh, IRC, for example, and most people I think would be more open to join the the, the matrix uh, servers if people tell them there's this guy looking for you, like. A couple of weeks ago, I think it was you actually that, <laughs> that contacted me on uh, on the QMO upstream IRC and told me there's somebody that has a QMO bug on Fedora. So um, being uh, in uh, upstream uh, IRC in Fedora uh, matrix, uh, CentOS matrix, Red Hat Slack, uh, email, whatever, that's like it's everywhere. It's too much for everyone, uh, but. I mean, if uh, I think the first contact should always happen by email, but then, yeah, I mean, if I know that uh, that I'm working with somebody that uh, is preferably on the CentOS metrics, I will just keep a, a, an element tab open in the browser for the two weeks that it needs. Like th this is up to to, this, to the individual person. For what is worth, this isn't specific to the kernel. It's yes. kind of a common pet peeve that unless like people in this room are probably fine in that we we know how to find the right people but if you come from the outside and you're, if you're not like deeply involved it's really hard sometimes to find even who is the person at Red Hat that maintains dollar component in center stream and then how do I talk to them yeah dollar component uh, I mean in theory you find that uh, in uh, by, by seeing who did the last the latest uh, merges uh, in uh, in this git or, or in the changelog which sometimes is about account? Yeah, which sometimes is like three years ago. Uh, <laughs> like if it's three years ago, you probably uh, you probably should not even try to change that package. But still, uh, no, uh, it, it it's uh, it depends. So um, it depends on the package. The, the lucky uh, case is where you have some a package where that is involved in the upstream development. Maybe not in the exact part of the code that they are touching, but if you have some kind of relationship between upstream developers, it's always easier to get to the right person uh, on on the Fedora slash CentOS slash uh, yeah. to, side. To Neil's point, I feel like there would be value in like having a bit of a cultural shift in which people involved in things that touch CentOS get used to hanging out in the project spaces so they can be somehow reached for informal conversations. Yes, the, the, the question but I get is, it that uh, it's hard. I, I totally agree on one hand uh, uh, and on the other hand, uh, what is affecting CentOS? Like somebody that is creating a merge request uh, in the source git for the kernel is as far removed from the CentOS project as possible. They probably only work with um, CKI, with the bots, uh, with, uh, uh, with the source git, but they are like, there's not even that many Red Hat people here uh, at CentOS Connect, <laughs> so. No, no, I, 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 I mean, I, I'm saying it's, it's not just a cultural shift, it's just that CentOS is transparent in many cases to people that work at Red Hat, and that's not necessarily a bad thing. But I agree that it kind of hinders collaboration and uh, and contributions. Thanks. Yeah. <clears throat>